Okay. So welcome everybody to round two of the Algebra Particles and Quantum Theory Seminar Series. I'm grateful to be able to introduce to you tonight's speaker, John Baez. John started out in mathematics at Princeton University where he completed a thesis with a rather intriguing title, Recursivity in Quantum Mechanics. He then went on to do a PhD at MIT with supervisor Irving Segal. Uh, fast forward a few years and John is now based at UC Riverside and maintains affiliations with the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore and the Topos Institute in Berkeley. In mathematical physics, John is knowledgeable in perhaps an unparalleled number of topics. In fact, it would be more efficient to list the topics that he hasn't written about. A quick search through his list of co-authored books or his blog Azimuth or N Category Cafe, which he co-founded, shows John's extensive works on algebraic and constructive QFT, loop quantum gravity, higher category theory, applied category theory, quantum techniques for stochastic mechanics, quantum foundations, and countless others. He is the author of the classic paper on division algebras entitled The Optonions, which serves for many of us as our first point of reference on the subject. Together with John Huerta, John Bias uh, won the Levi L. Conant Prize for their paper, The Algebra of Grand Unified Theories, which is a paper that I feel every self-respecting particle physicist should know about. Tonight, John will be telling us about the 10 real associative superdivision algebras and how their ghostly figure materializes in the context of Clifford algebras in bot periodicity and within the characterization of 10 different types of matter based on discrete symmetries. His talk is entitled The Tenfold Way. Now, typically before a seminar, a seminar, I like to encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the talk, especially students. Um, however, uh, today's crowd is a bit larger than usual, um, so it would be helpful if you could please ask only clarification questions during the talk, um, and it will be fair game to ask more expansive questions after John's talk. Okay, so John, anytime you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. It's uh, great to have a chance to sp speak about this subject. So I've been thinking about the tenfold way for a wh while, <clears throat> and I've developed maybe too much to say about it, but so I'll focus on just a, a portion of this idea. So there are 10 different ways that Hamiltonians can get along with time reversal and charge conjugation symmetry, and I'll explain those 10 ways. There are also 10 associative real superdivision algebras. Uh, you may know about the plain old fashioned real division algebras, which are the real numbers, the complex numbers, and the quaternions. So those are three of these 10 guys, but I'll explain this more general concept uh, in my talk. There are 10 uh, Morita equivalence classes of real and complex Clifford algebras. Uh, you may have heard of Clifford algebras, and you may know that real Clifford algebras have this period eight phenomenon, so that there are really only ten, so only eight truly different kinds, and then after that they sort of repeat and get bigger and bigger in a predictable way. And there are two complex Clifford algebras, two Morita equivalence classes of them. So eight plus two equals ten, and believe it or not, that's connected to these other tens. And there are also ten classical families of these highly uh, symmetrical spaces studied by Cartan called compact symmetric spaces. And it's really a mystery to me why those 10 classes perfectly line up with these other 10 things, although it's not a mystery to me how you get symmetric spaces from these other things. Uh, unfortunately, I won't really have time to talk about that. Um, and the whole subject of the tenfold way showed up in condensed matter physics, where they have various classifications of uh, states of matter or Hamil types of Hamiltonians for uh, systems of free fermions, for example, uh, which give other ways to get at this tenfoldness. And I, even though that's like the most physical aspect uh, in some ways, that is the most practical physical aspect, I won't really talk about that at all. Uh, so the physics in this talk will be mostly about the first bullet point here. Okay, so let's start from the beginning, and I'll start from something simpler called the threefold way. So in fact, I'm going to try to take a pretty elementary approach and start with some stuff about quantum mechanics, 
some of which you all know, and some of which you may not know, but you should know. <laughs> so I'll tell you. So, so um, we use unit vectors in a Hilbert space to describe pure states in quantum mechanics. I'm only going to be talking about pure states. I'll just say states, I guess. And what you can do with them, for starters, is calculate the tr transition probability. You put a system in state phi. You uh, measure whether it's in state C, you find it sometimes is and sometimes isn't. The probability is the absolute value of the inner product of those two states squared. And that probability doesn't change if you multiply either psi or phi by a phase that is a unit complex number. So people figured out pretty early on that pure states in quantum mechanics are really described given not by unit vectors, but by equivalence classes of unit vectors where you say two unit vectors count as the same if they differ by a phase, or maybe differ is a misleading word, if one of them is the other multiplied by a phase, a unit complex number. Uh, so really, we're, we should work with these equivalence classes. And one of these equivalence classes is a point in what's called the projective space, the projective space of our Hilbert space, or PH. Um, so, the, so that nuance there, um, is is very very important. It manifests itself in many ways in physics, and one of them is uh, in Wigner's theorem, which I guess goes back to around 1931, uh, which says, suppose you have a Hilbert space, and then suppose you have a map from the projective space to itself that preserves transition probability, so that if you apply this map to these equivalence classes, you get new equivalence classes where the transition probabilities between them are the same. So that would be like the physically significant sense of symmetry, a map that preserves transition probabilities. And he concludes that any such map comes from either a unitary operator, and then you go, yeah, yeah, I know about those, or an anti-unitary operator, and that's slightly more interesting. So a unitary operator just preserves everything, addition, multiplication by complex numbers, and the inner product, whereas an anti-unitary operator preserves addition, but it's, a, it's an anti-linear operator, meaning that if you pull a number, a scalar through it, it comes out with a complex conjugate. And also it, it doesn't preserve the inner product, it takes the inner product and, and, uh, and complex conjugates it. So this raises the possibility that symmetries in physics can be described either by unitaries or by anti-unitaries and that that real possibility really occurs. And you can see it very clearly if you focus your attention on the simple case of this, some discrete symmetries, namely symmetries that square to one. And there are three super famous ones of those. Parity, which is uh, sending each point in space to it, it's negative, and so it's uh, turning left-handed people into right-handed people and vice versa. Uh, charge conjugation, to be turning, I guess, if, since I'm talking about people, people made of matter into people made of antimatter. Uh, or in condensed matter physics, there are many times there are systems where you have particles or holes, absences of particles, which act like particles themselves. Uh, and although Dirac's theory of antimatter was that antimatter was holes, we don't really exactly think of antiparticles in quantum field theory is holes anymore, but in but in condensed matter physics, holes are a real thing. So it's like semiconductors have sometimes carry current in the form of holes. And so charge conjugation is a symmetry that um, may or not, may not exist in a particular system, which switches particles and holes. And then time reversal, switching the direction of time, for, for example, flipping the velocity of a particle to its negative. So systems may or may not have any one of these symmetries, and they also may be symmetric just under certain combinations of these symmetries, which you could call CP, PT, CT, or CPT. Um, those names are probably a little bit misleading for what I'm doing, because what I'm saying is that you may have a physical system which does not have C symmetry and which does not have P symmetry. So, the, so technically CP doesn't make sense, but but you, it may be symmetrical under the combined operation of switching particles and antiparticles and uh, also um, parity, for example. 
Um, right. So, so let's think about what can happen with these symmetries that square to one. So suppose you've got a map from the projective space to itself that preserves transition probabilities. And if you do it twice, you get back where you started from. So Wigner's theorem says there's got to be two options that either comes from a unitary or an anti-unitary. But because it, the symmetry squares to one, that means that if it came from a unitary, that unitary would square to some phase because of any phase acts as the identity on the projective space. And if it came from an anti-unitary, well, then you'd have an anti-unitary that when you square it, you get a phase. But there are very different possibilities. These possibilities behave in a very different way from each other. Because in the unitary case, if you have u squared equals some phase c, then you can just adjust your unitary by multiplying it by an appropriate phase, namely c to the negative one half power. Now you have a new unitary, which squares to one again. And because this new unitary differs from the old, old only by a phase, it has the same effect on the projective space. So it has the same physical effect. And, it and we've just managed to conveniently get it so that it squares to one. So in other words, in the unitary case, you may just as well assume it squares to, to one without loss of generality. But the anti-unitary case, that's not true. Because for the anti-unitary operator, if you try the same trick of adjusting it by a phase, it, that doesn't change the square. Because when you pull the phase through one of those j's, it switches to its complex conjugate. And you get, and you get c times c bar, which is one. So you're stuck with this phase in the anti-unitary case. But the interesting thing is the phase can't be just any old phase because you can do a little calculation here. See, we know that if we pull this phase through J, it comes out complex conjugated, but we also are assuming that J squared is equal to this phase. But J does commute with J squared because any power of anything commutes with itself in this associated world here. Uh, and so, so the phase also does commute with J. So, so we get these two equations, one saying it commutes with a complex conjugate and the other that it just commutes. And the only options are that C is its complex conjugate, so which for a phase means it's plus or minus one. So we can't just get any old phase. It has to be plus or minus one. So in other words, we've got three basic options for symmetries that square to the identity. They can come from a unitary, in which case without loss of gen generality, we may well assume it squares one, but if it's implemented by an anti-unitary, then we have two choices, j squared equals one or j squared equals minus one. So the anti-unitaries are much more exciting than the unitaries from this point of view, and that's where I'll be focusing my attention. Now, there are these two cases that are really interesting for a bunch of reasons. For one thing is, suppose you have an anti-unitary that squares to one. Well, that reminds you a lot of complex conjugation. Complex conjugation is an anti-unitary map from the complex unit numbers to themselves that squares to one. And so you can do tricks with any such J that are like you would do for complex conjugation. In particular, you can focus your attention on the vectors that are preserved by this J and they will form a real vector space uh, that is still be closed under multiplication by real numbers. And it's actually a real Hilbert space. There's a perfectly fine concept of a Hilbert space over the real numbers. Uh, and that's what this real part will be. And your original, so I'll call that H sub R, and the original Hilbert space is just the complexification of that real Hilbert space. In other words, any vector in the original Hilbert space is just a linear combination of two vectors in your real Hilbert space, a real part and an imaginary part. So it would be like A times one of these guys plus I, B times another one of these guys. Um, just like the complex plane is the complexification of the real line. So there's an underlying uh, real Hilbert space structure in this situation. And if your anti-unitary squares to minus one, then it turns out there's an underlying quaternionic structure. Because in that case, you can take these operators, take ordinary multiplication by I, make up, uh, make up a new thing called J, which is this anti-unitary J, and then the product of those two, which we'll call K. And if you do a few calculations, you see that these three operators, I, J, and K, obey the usual relations 
for the Quaternions, which Hamilton scrawled on a wall in, uh, in uh, Dublin, I guess. And, and so what we're getting here is that the, you have now ways to take vectors in your Hilbert space and multiply them, not just by complex numbers, but by quaternions, if you want. And so the, thus you can make your Hilbert space into a quaternionic Hilbert space. Now those are a little more obscure than, than even real Hilbert spaces, but in fact, the theory of Hilbert spaces works pretty darn well for quaternions as well. Uh, and so I'm, I mean it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so then what's going on is that your original Hilbert space is what you call the underlying complex Hilbert space. In other words, the Hilbert space where you just forget about J and K and just only think about multiplying by complex numbers. If you want to think like an algebraist, you're, you've got this quaternionic Hilbert space. That's a, a, a left H module, but because the complex numbers are contained in the quaternions H, then you can tensor with over C with the complex numbers and, and you get a left C module, namely an ordinary complex vector space. If you don't know what all that stuff means, it, it's just a fancy way of saying that like we're forgetting that we can multiply by quaternions and only thinking about uh, multiplying by the complex numbers. But I wrote it in this way to make the analogy with the previous slide uh, more, more sh sharp. So the real numbers, the complex and the quaternions all show up in quantum physics. I had been wondering for years, why did nature pick to use complex Hilbert spaces instead of these three, these other two? Uh, and then eventually I realized that it actually has picked all three. They're all, they're all there. Um, so, so why are those three guys special? Well, you probably know, or at least some of you probably know, uh, but I'll come out and say it here. So I'm gonna say the word algebra a bunch of times, and I always mean a finite dimensional real algebra. So it's a real vector space with an associative product that distributes over linear combinations, and it has a unit, one multiplicative unit. So then with all those caveats, um, a division algebra is going to be for me an algebra where any non zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Notice I'm assuming that it's associative. I'm, I love the Octonians, but that's not what today's talk is about. And so I don't want to keep saying associative algebra. My, I, that's the only kind I'm talking about today. Um, and so then for Obenius, I guess sometime around 1898, maybe, I forget, uh, proved that there are exactly three division algebras, the real numbers, the complex numbers, and the quaternions. So we're seeing those all showing up naturally, starting from a traditional attitude of purely complex quantum mechanics, but carefully analyzing what symmetries should be, that symmetries do not necessarily need to be linear, they're just maps on the projective space to preserve uh, transition probabilities. And then we see that there that uh, all these three number systems show up from that very physical assumption. And the role of the division algebras in quantum physics becomes even clearer if you focus on systems that have extra symmetries. In other words, not just a bare Hilbert space, but a Hilbert space on which some group is acting as symmetries. Now, I've just told you that symmetries could be unitary or anti-unitary. Uh, so a detailed study of this would go into both of those in this, uh, in this, on this slide here. And actually, I urge you to read uh, Gregory Moore's uh, lecture notes about this whole subject where he considers the anti-unitary case here as well. But anyway, I'm just going to talk about unitary representations of groups right now and how they interact with these anti-unitary operators that I was just talking about. So a unitary representation of a group on a Hilbert space will be one unitary operator for each group element in a way that when you multiply the two group elements, those operators multiply and the group operator for the identity in your group is the identity operator. So your group is acting as unitary transformations on your Hilbert space. And the simplest of the representations are the ones called irreducible which are the ones where the only closed subspaces that are preserved by all the group elements are the zero dimensional subspace and the whole Hilbert space. Uh, for unitary representations, you can show that um, 
a representation is irreducible if and only if it's not the direct sum of two other representations. So you can think of the irreducible representations as the ones that can't be broken down any further. And they're sort of the building blocks of representation theory. And that's why they show up a lot when we're studying elementary particles. It, uh, there's a funny analogy between elementary particles and uh, irreducible group representations. It's more than just an analogy. We use the latter to describe the, the former. But, but I, what I meant is the analogies, we can try to like bust a particle into smaller particles by hitting it with a hammer or something like that. And here we're doing the same type of thing with a group representation. Okay, so sure had this amazingly powerful lemma that we use a lot that says that if you have an irreducible unitary representation of a group G on a Hilbert space H, then the only unitary operators on that Hilbert space that commute with all the group uh, with all the operators coming from your group could be our phases, multipl multiplication by a phase. So that's not much, um, not many possibilities. Uh, so various other people, including sure, I, I suspect, studied what happens with the anti-unitary operators that commute with all the uh, with all the operators rho g. But the first person to, I think, write a really detailed paper about it was uh, Freeman Dyson in the 60s. So, and he coined the term the free, the threefold way. So, so I'm honoring him uh, with, the, with this one here. Uh, so suppose rho is an irreducible unitary representation of a group G on a Hilbert space H, then there are three possibilities, which are mutually exclusive. So only one of these could be true. And one of them <laughs> must be true. So there's either an anti-unitary operator who, with j squared equals negative one that commutes with all the rho g, or there's an anti-unitary operator with j squared equals one commuting with all the rho g, or there's no anti-unitary operator commuting with all the rho g. So the only thing you have to prove here really is that there can't be both an anti-unitary with j squared equals one and also an anti-unitary with j squared equals minus one uh, commuting with them. That makes this then into a, a trichotomy. So in the first case, or the negative first case, I'm going to call it, uh, then what I've already sh shown you is that then rho uh, is actually coming from a representation on a quaternionic Hilbert space. And so we call these people mathematicians call these representations quaternionic. So they're on a complex Hilbert space, but actually you could promote it to a quaternionic Hilbert space. Uh, in the other case where j squared equals one, then we've seen that rho, uh, we've seen that you can find a uh, uh, real Hilbert space hiding inside your complex Hilbert space and, and rho will actually preserve that uh, real Hilbert space. So rho will be the complexification of our representation on a real Hilbert space. And in that case, we call our representation rho real because it comes from a real representation. And in the third case where neither of the two is true, then people use the slightly confusing term that they call it complex, meaning that it's just complex. There's nothing more you can do with it. It's just only complex. Um, so there's this beautiful trichotomy here and we see it in life, for example, what about representations of SU2? So the irreducible representations of SU2, there's one for every spin J. Uh, and it turns out that every in any one of those representations, uh, all the transformations coming from SU2 do commute with some anti-unitary. Unfortunately, I'm calling this anti-unitary J. Now you're probably thinking about uh, angular momentum and quantum mechanics especially if I write J squared and I should, probably should have not called it J, but it was irresistible because of the connection to quaternions. So there are two possibilities. One is that J squared is equal to the identity. And that happens when your spin is an integer. And the other possibility is that J squared equals minus one. And that happens when the spin is a half integer. So for example, the spin one representation of SU2 is a representation on the on the complex vector space C3, just the complexification of a representation on the space R3. So if you work it out, you see that SU2 
is just preserving R3 sitting inside C3. And that's not surprising because in this particular case, the way SU2 is acting is really just as ordinary rotations on R3. And then you complexify it and you get C3. So, so that's what's going on there. And on the other hand, more excitingly, the spin one half representation is a quaternionic representation. We normally think of it as a representation on C squared, but what I'm saying is that really you could think of that as coming from a representation on H. Both C squared and H have real dimension four, uh, but what I'm saying is that C squared is what you get when you take H and you forget how to multiply by J and K. And in fact, the way that SU2 is acting is incredibly beautiful um, because SU2 you can think of as the group of quaternions whose absolute value is one. And so that those quaternions act on H, the quaternions, by uh, right multiplication. And that commutes with, uh, that commutes with uh, left multiplication by the quaternions. So that that's a, makes it into a, a quaternionic representation. So who knew the humble uh, electron was a quaternion all along. So, so we find, that this uh, is a general thing for any representation that you can break up into irreducibles, we can apply this analysis to. So suppose you have a unitary representation of a compact Lie group. Uh, in that case, you can always break it down into a direct sum of irreducibles. And, I, and what we can do here is we can group those irreducibles into the quaternionic ones, take the sum of all of those, the complex ones, Take the sum of all of those and the real one. So we split our representation into a direct sum of, of three parts. We're able to do this in a canonical way without making any choices. And even more cool is the fact that this, now I'll finally explain why I call these three choices negative one, uh, zero, and one. The set of these three numbers is actually uh, closed under multiplication, if you think of them as real numbers. And it's and it actually has this beautiful property that if you take two different unitary representations, uh, their jth part, where j is negative one, zero, or, or one, can be con computed from the, the part, from the various parts of the two things that you're tensoring. So, um, so we're getting this uh, nice relationship here between tensor products and this grading of our representation into three parts. So this is an efficient way of saying things like, if you tensor two quaternionic representations, then you get a real representation because negative one times negative one is one. If you tensor a two real representations, you get a real representation. If you tensor anything with a complex representation, you get a complex representation because zero swallows ne negative one and one. And this is sort of the dominance of the complex numbers over the other two division algebras, which has something to do with why we probably think that the uh, complex, uh, the quantum mechanics is, is innately complex. Um, so you may have seen graded vector spaces. You probably haven't seen graded vector spaces graded by this uh, monoid, which I'm calling three, uh, but, but this is a, an interesting innate structure in mathematics. So now, now what about 10? So the tenfold way is just an elaboration of this set of ideas. Um, first, I'll start out with a physics-y way of thinking about it, and then I'll sort of move it over towards more of a pure mathematical way. So one way to think about it, that's sort of an application of the mathematical way, is to say that the tenfold way describes the options for charge conjugation and time reversal. In condensed matter physics, we assume that those are commuting anti unitary operators on the, on the single particle space. Uh, so time reversal symmetry, it squares to one physically. So that means by our analysis that as the anti-unitary operator, it must either square to one or square to negative one if your system has time reversal symmetry. But there's another possibility that your system just doesn't have time reversal symmetry. It's just not symmetrical in that way. Similarly, with charge conjugation symmetry, you could square to one or negative one, or you could just not have it at all. So that's three times three different options for, for how these symmetries could behave or not exist at all. So that's a nine, but there's a 10th, 
which is that it's possible that you may only have the combination of both time reversal symmetry and charge conjugation symmetry. We could call that CT, but that would be misleading. That would be misleading since we don't have uh, C and T separately. So they call it S and that one will be unitary. And so we've seen, you can assume that it's square is equal to one. So we get a total of 10 options. Okay, that's one way to think about it. Uh, and that makes it sound like you need to know about things like particles and antiparticles and time reversal to get this stuff happening. But in fact, it, it's, it's even more fundamental than that. Um, it, it happens whenever you have your Hilbert space chopped into two parts. So a super Hilbert space is just a Hilbert space that's written as the direct sum of two parts, H0 and H1, which we call uh, even and odd parts. <clears throat> so we could call states even if they're in H0 and odd if they're in H1. Now, there are different applications of super Hilbert spaces. And if you hear the word super and you're a physicist, you may be thinking, oh no, now we're starting to do supersymmetry. Or you may be thinking, yay, now we're finally starting to do supersymmetry. But in that kind of application, what we would be doing is we'd be letting H0 describe bosonic states and H1 describe fermionic states. And that's perfectly fine application of the math I'm going to talk about. But in fact, in condensed matter physics, that's not the main way. I've never even seen them try to use it that way. That's not the main way they apply this idea of the super Hilbert space. What they do instead is they think of H0 as a space of particle states, states of a single particle. So we're not doing second quantization here, uh, right here. And H1 is a, is a Hilbert space for antiparticles or holes, actually, they would call them holes. Um, and sometimes the way this happens is that you have some dispersion relation where momentum uh, and energy are are related as graphed by this hyperboloid. And then you'd say, okay, the states up here, we'll call them in H0, and the states down here, we'll call them in H1. Um, so when you have this situation and you start stud studying anti-unitary operators in this situation, you can, there are two especially nice kinds of anti-unitaries. Um, there are even ones, which map H0 to H0 and H1 to H1. And then there are odd ones that switch H0 and H1. There are also anti-unitaries that just completely mix up H0 and H1 in a, in a messy way, but these two are particularly nice. So we're gonna get a more refined classification of anti-unitaries in this situation where we have a graded Hilbert space or a super Hilbert space. And I'm gonna think about symmetries as well. So I'm gonna have a symmetry group running around, but I'll let it be a Z mod two graded group. And that just means it's a group that's a union of two disjoint subsets. So we say there are even elements and odd elements and having the property that if you multiply uh, an even guy and an even guy, you get an even guy, or if you multiply an even guy and an odd guy, you get an odd guy in either order. Or if you multiply two odd elements, you get an an even element. So we're doing addition mod two here in this, which is why it's called Z mod two graded. Um, so then people will talk about a unitary representation of a Z mod two graded group on a super Hilbert space. So it's just an ordinary unitary representation, but it has the property that it gets along with these <clears throat> gradings. So if G is in G I and Psi is in H J, then when you Pi rho of g to psi, you get a vector in h i plus j, where again, we're adding mod two. So in other words, some of your group elements will be even and they will then they will map even vectors to even vectors and odd vectors to odd vectors. And some of your group elements may be odd and they will switch even and odd vectors. So we can talk about irreducible unitary representations of this kind, but we demand we change the definition now. Now, what we want to say is that the only closed subspaces that are the direct sum of an even part and an odd part and are preserved by all the group elements are zero in the whole Hilbert space. So we're putting a restriction on the subspaces that need to 
have this property. It's a, this is a weakening of the usual concept of irreducibility because we don't. There could be other weird subspaces that aren't of this form that that uh, are preserved by all the group elements. <clears throat> so, so now we get the tenfold way when we study irreducible unitary representations of a Z mod two graded group for Hilbert space. We discover that there are now 10 different kinds and they are classified in the way similar to the threefold way, but I'm gonna formalize it a little bit more. We're gonna look at the commutant, which means the set of all operators that commute with all the rho G, but here I mean real linear operators because it's not necessarily complex linear because I want to allow anti-unitary operators into the game. Uh, and so it turns out that you, you get <clears throat> these following options. So there may be an even unitary operator that commutes with all these row of Gs. And then it could have T squared equals one or T squared equals minus one. Or maybe there's no such unit, no such anti-unitary. And there may be an odd anti-unitary that commutes with all these rows of Gs and it could square to one or negative one, uh, or it might not exist. So we get nine options from considering whether we have even or odd anti-unitary operators that commute with all these rows of Gs. And then finally, there's a 10th type where there aren't either of those two, but there's an odd unitary operator that commutes with all the row of Gs. And we can assume without loss of generality that S squared is equal to one. Notice we always get phases that commute with everything with all the rows of Gs. Phases will commute with all these rows of Gs, but they will be unitaries, not anti-unitaries, of course. And they will also be even because they map uh, H0 to itself and H1 to itself because they're just phases. Um, so the interesting classification arises from thinking about the possibilities of either anti-unitaries that commute with all the rows of Gs or odd unitaries. Um, of course, if we have T and C, we can then go ahead and multiply them and we will get an, we will get an odd unitary that will act like this S. Uh, but we may also have this S without such a T or C. So we get these 10 options. And in condensed matter physics, people have go gone through and tried to make physical uh, systems that have all 10 of these behaviors. And uh, if I had more knowledge, I would like to rattle off a bunch of examples of, of different systems uh, with, with, with each of these 10 behaviors, or at least a bunch of these 10 behaviors. Some I don't think I've seen <laughs> in the literature actually showing up yet in, in real life. Um, but, but like the threefold way, What's going on here is that we really have a, a set of 10 options, and I'll call this set X because I'm going to go medieval or actually go Roman on you and, and call it X. And, and what, we, what you can see from, from what I've just said is that if you have a unitary representation of a Z mod 2 graded group on a super Hilbert space, if it is a direct sum of irreducibles, for example, that would happen if G was compact, you can always split up that representation into a direct sum of irreducibles of the various 10 types that I've described. So if you let rho of i be the sum of all the irreducibles of the i type, uh, then rho will be the sum of these different pieces, rho sub i. And then the cool part is that there's a way to add elements of this 10 element set that makes a formula true similar to the formula I showed you for the threefold way. For the threefold way, that set, which I called three, was conveniently thought of as just the numbers negative one, zero, and one. And then the operation was, was nice to call it multiplication because it just happened to work out just fine. Here, it's probably a little more convenient to call this operation addition. That's just sort of a terminology thing. So, so the, in other words, to get the j piece of rho tensor rho prime, you run around looking for all i and i prime that sum up to j, and you take the ith piece of the first representation and the i prime piece of the second representation, and, and you tensor them. This addition on the set x makes it into a commutative 
monoid. It's not a group, just like our three element set was not a group, right? Zero had no inverse. So we get, we, we don't, it's not a group, but it's a commutative thing with an associative multiplication, associative and commutative multiplication. So what is it? Well, it's the disjoint union of the group Z mod eight, which has eight elements, and the group Z mod two, which has two elements. How in the heck do you add an element in Z mod eight and an element in Z mod two? Well, for starters, if you have two elements that are both in Z mod eight or both in Z mod two, you add them the usual way. You just addition mod eight and addition mod two. So the weird part is adding a guy in Z mod eight with a guy in Z mod two. So then what you do is you add them, but then you do it mod two. So, so, so because eight because eight is divisible by two, that, that's, a, that's a thing that makes sense to take a guy in Z mod eight and look at what it is mod two and get a guy in Z mod two. So for example, we, let me do some examples. I'm gonna give a names to these guys. I'll call the first eight zero through eight. Well, let's see, I guess I can't count though, but it should be zero through seven because uh, we're working mod eight. So, so eight is the same as equal to zero. I guess this is technically true, but you have to remind you that eight is the same as zero, but that, that was a mistake on my part. Uh, and then the other two guys, the guys in DMOD two, I guess I'm going to use bold face for them and call them zero and one with bold face. You can't pronounce a bold face any differently than a normal number. So, so two plus three is five, but then one plus one is equal to zero. That's adding DMOD two. But then the interesting case is some, something like this. So we do like six plus one. So that would be seven maybe, but we take it mod two. And so we get one. So this, you can check, gives you a commutative and associative operation on this 10 element set. That may not be instantly obvious, but it's a fun little exercise. Is there a straightforward um, way? Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Is, is there a straightforward way to, to see how the, how the, um, the uh, three mon the monoid uh, relating to the threefold way kind of fits inside of the monoid related to the tenfold way. Yeah, there is. I'll, I I think the easiest way is to show you this picture, and then I'll so here I'm showing the tenfold way picture, and I'll in a second I'll show you where the three which ones are the ones the threefold way is a sub thing of this tenfold thing. So here are the options. So here's zero up through seven. So those are the, uh, th those are the ones in, in Z mod eight. And then this bold face zero and ones are the two options in Z mod two. And so for each one, I'm telling you whether there is or is not uh, anti-unitary operator uh, C or T and having the squaring to one or minus one. So zero, bold face zero is the one where, the, where the neither C nor T exist. Bold face one is where only the the uh, sort of the combination uh, exists, which we're calling S. Um, and so the the um, the threefold way sits inside this one as uh, zero and bold face zero and four. So it's sort of down the vertical here. Uh, so this T squared. Is the th is the thing that in the threefold way I'd been calling j squared. So so if I if I if I called this t j, it would be more evident that we're sort of doing the same thing there. We're we're not having any c running around. We just have one uh, one even anti-unitary. I guess is what's going on. It could square to one, or it could square to negative one, or it could not be there at all. And so that's the threefold way. Mm -hmm. So it takes some calculating to check that like, if I have a Hilbert space with operators having these properties and a Hilbert space with operators having these properties and I tensor them, I get a Hilbert space with operators satisfying these properties. And you let, but you can, you can check that type of stuff. Um, it's, 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 it's sort of subtle actually, um, but, but it's a calculation of some sort. So now just as that set three was turned out to be the set of the three division algebras. The set X or 10 or whatever you want to call it is secretly the set of the super division algebras. What the heck is a super division algebra? So it's a super algebra. That's a, an algebra that's written as a direct sum of two pieces, which we'll call an even and an odd part. 
which has the property that multiplication respects that that uh, rating. So you know, an even thing times an even thing is another even thing, and even times an odd is an odd. Product of two odds is even. And then a super division algebra is a super algebra where any non-zero element that is either even or odd, so that it completely lives in one or the other of these two pieces, has a multiplicative inverse. So there again, this clause here is weakening the usual condition on a division algebra that says that anybody who's not zero has a multiplicative inverse. Here we're saying only, only the ones that are, what do you call homogeneous, only the ones that actually live in one of these two pieces has to have a multiplicative inverse. So that's how we get to have more super division algebras than we had division algebras. So, so there are 10 super, I'll tell you 10 super division algebras in a minute, but just to like get you revved up, you could take the ordinary complex numbers and make it into a super division algebra in two different ways. It's a division algebra, okay? It's, we, it's a, we know it's a division algebra, but when you make it into a super division algebra, you have to say what's even and what's odd. And so you can make everything even, and that would be one way to get a super division algebra, but there's another way you take the real numbers to count as even, so the subspace of, of real numbers is even, and the subset base of imaginary numbers you take to be odd, and then that indeed has this, this kind of property here, right? Like imaginary times imaginary is real and so on. So those are distinct superdivision algebras, even though they both come from the same division algebra. So that's basically the part of the trick for how we get so many of them. Um, I'm not sure really who classified the 10 superdivision algebras. So CTC Wall definitely did a huge amount of work in discovering uh, th this stuff. Um, and then later on, Deline wrote a, a beautiful paper laying out the classification of the 10 superdivision algebras. And there may be other people involved who deserve credit here, but this is the theorem that there are 10 of them. So here they are. So amazingly, they are all Clifford algebras. Well, Cliff zero is a very boring Clifford algebra. It's just the real numbers. And I'm going to treat it as a superdivision algebra where every element is even. Uh, Cliff one, now we're starting to get into some actual exciting Clifford algebras, but not all that exciting. What we're going to do is we're going to take the uh, we're going to take the real numbers and we're going to throw in a square root of negative one. That sounds awfully like the complex numbers. Yes, it is the complex numbers, but we're going to throw in an odd square root of one. That is, we're going to treat i as an odd uh, element of our super algebra. So this is complex numbers, but where the imaginaries are odd. Um, now we're really getting to Clifford algebras here. Now we're going to take the free super algebra on two anti-commuting odd square roots of one. So we take, in, take two square roots of negative one, treat them both as odd, and we get a super algebra that way. And that's the quaternions, but it's the quaternions where you could say like i and j are odd, and then k, which is their product, is even. Uh, so you can keep on throwing in more square roots of negative one, and we're throwing in odd square roots of negative one. So we think of the Clifford algebra as a super algebra in that way. So Cliff three will have three anti-commuting odd square roots of negative one thrown in, uh, and then we let them freely generate a super algebra. And this, as an algebra, is isomorphic to direct sum of the quaternions with themselves. So this is an algebra that would not be a division algebra, but we can treat it as, but it is a superdivision algebra. We could have thrown in square roots of, of plus one. Um, so we could make look at the free super algebra on an odd square root of, of one, and that's the algebra R direct sum R. We could throw in two, and then you get an algebra, which is the two by two real matrices. You could th throw in th three, and you'd get two by two complex matrices. So all of these are also superdivision algebras. You may wonder, why did I stop at three? Uh, why did I like switch and start going to square roots of plus one instead of throwing in more square roots of negative one? Well, thing is that when you throw in four, that's too many. So neither cliff four, that is where you throw in four square roots of negative one, nor this other guy where you throw in 
four square roots of plus one. Neither of those is a superdivision algebra. Um, so the buck stops there in a sense, but actually both of them are Morita equivalent to a certain superdivision algebra, namely the quaternions, but the quaternions, you can think of it as a superdivision algebra where every element is even. That, that's one way you can think of it as a superdivision algebra. So what's this Morita equivalence business? Well, what we care about about these algebras are their representations, how they act on vector spaces. And so you say that two super algebras are Morita equivalent if they have equivalent categories of representations and, and super algebras like to act on super vector spaces. And you can show that cliff N is Morita equivalent to cliff N plus eight. So although the Clifford algebras keep marching on and on forever, getting bigger and bigger, uh, in terms of their categories of representations, they loop around, you get back to an equivalent category of representations after eight. So here what I did is I went almost four in one direction, almost four in the other direction, uh, but by the time you go for in throwing in the, either uh, square roots of one or square roots of negative one, you get you get Morita equivalent things. So you get all those, and here they are. So so these are eight uh, superdivision algebras, and these are giving us the Z mod eight in our in our previous chart in some uh, sneaky way, um, and two of them are purely even. So here. Cliff four is not equal to the quaternions, it's just Morita equivalent to it. The rest of them, these are actually equal to it. I could have written equal, I probably should have. Um, but okay, that's eight. What about the other two? Well, there are also such things called as complex Clifford algebras, where you start with the complex numbers and you, you start throwing in uh, square roots of negative one, additional square roots of negative one. So I've been mainly talking about algebras over the real numbers, but now I'm really here looking at certain algebras over the complex numbers. So cliff zero with this fancy C here is, is just the complex numbers. We haven't thrown in any extra square roots of negative one yet. And then cliff one would be where you throw in an extra square root of negative one. And then it turns out that, uh, that you get C plus C the direct sum of two copies of C. And this kind of complex Clifford algebra also has periodicity, but it's mod two periodicity. So cliff N plus two is Morita equivalent to cliff N. So you get two more uh, superdivision algebras this way. And just for fun, I'm drawing it as a smaller circle inside the bigger circle. That doesn't really mean anything too much. I don't think. Um, and so, right. So we get th three purely even superdivision algebras, which are our good old friends, the division algebras, R, C, and H. And then we get these uh, other ones that are only superdivision algebras. Um, and so the remarkable fact is that these two groups of 10 things that I've described actually do correspond to each other. I may have bamboozled you into thinking that they do, but I hadn't actually sh shown it yet to you. Uh, and it takes some time to show it. So I'm claiming that there's a specific God-given one-to-one correspondence between first thing I showed you, the 10 different ways that unitary or anti-unitary operators can commute with an irreducible represent unitary representation of a supergroup I, sh I should say Z mod two graded group. That's what I meant to say on a super Hilbert space and the 10 super division algebras. I, I did sort of sketch out why the 10 super division algebras correspond to the 10 Morita equivalence classes of real and complex Clifford algebras because the way I presented you these super division algebras is I described them as being Clifford algebras but it should still be mysterious in your mind why in the world it worked out that way. Why starting from superdivision algebras should you be inevitably led to be thinking about Clifford algebras? In physics, we like to think about Clifford algebras to, uh, because uh, representations of Clifford algebras give you things called spinners or pinners, uh, which are 
uh, ways to des describe things transforming under the double cover of the rotation group. So it's very important for studying things like spin one half particles and space times of various dimension. But when we were talking about superdivision algebras, we had nothing about that on our mind. <clears throat> and so it's mysterious that Clifford algebras show up. So um, Wall's paper, uh, I think in 1964 about this subject, he shows why, they're, why they are connected. But the proof of the connection is pretty complicated. I wouldn't say we like have a good reason, simple reason why there is that connection. And I don't think we've exploited it fully yet either. This other connection, the, what the first item being connected to the other two, uh, I'll say a word about, but it also takes some work to, to show. But in any event, we get this set of 10 things and I call that the Brouwer wall monoid of, of R. Uh, that would be most illuminating to you if you had heard about Brouwer groups, uh, which are groups connected to division algebras over a field. Uh, it's the group of Morita equivalence classes of division algebras over the field. It's called the Brouwer group. And then Wall generalized it to the super context uh, and got a Brouwer wall group, so people call it. But here, this 10 here is not a group. It's a union of two different groups and, and it's a monoid. Um, here anyway, to finish off is the correspondence between the uh, superdivision algebras and these different ways that uh, a <clears throat> representation can commute with even or odd anti-unitaries. And so the kind of thing you have to do to establish this correspondence is to say, suppose I have a super Hilbert space on which I have an even unitary T that squares to negative one and an odd anti-unitary C that squares to negative one. Given that, I want to make my super Hilbert space into a module of, into a representation of the Clifford algebra, Cliff three. I want to show that I can get Cliff three to act on that. that. That's how the correspondence goes. And so you have to fiddle around with these operators to get the, to, to show that you can get Cliff three to act on it. Or conversely, given that Cliff three is acting on your super Hilbert space, show that I can cook up operators. Uh, T and C. Um, so I know how to do that, but the but I only know how to do it in a very pedestrian way where I just like go, oh, well, you do this and this and this and this and this. So I don't want to tell you that for 10 different things because it would bore the hell out of you. Or, uh, so uh, there's probably some better way to think about this that <laughs> lurking out there waiting for us to discover it, but uh, but I don't know it yet. Um, so So this is a really interesting pattern in mathematics that shows up in physics. And I really haven't even skimmed the surface of it, uh, especially in, if you read about it in papers on condensed matter physics, you'd see like a completely different uh, aspect of the story where they dig into how you actually build uh, Hamiltonians that give you physical theories that have each of these 10 possibilities of symmetry. And they build those Hamiltonians using uh, fermions, uh, and, and those fermions they describe with the help of these Clifford algebras. So that does provide a bridge between the symmetry description and the Clifford algebra description that, that uh, must be a clue as to what's going on. But I, alas, can't talk about that now. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks, John, for such a wonderful, uh, for such a wonderful talk. Um, can I ask a, a clarif uh, clarification question on your uh, previous slide? Sure. Um, Hi, Tevian. Tevian's here. <laughs> great. So in the in the second on the second point, um, so um, obviously there's uh, Clifford algebras are more general than just the CL zero comma n Clifford algebras that we considered um, in this in your talk. Um, is the claim so if you were to have a more general Clifford algebra with you know CL p comma q, um, is the claim that anything like this is going to be sorted into one of the ten Morita equivalence classes? Yeah, that's right. So um, 
So it turns out that a very general fact about, about Morita equivalence, let me just remind people what Morita equivalence is, they can stare at this. The general about Morita equivalence is that if you have an algebra, you can form a new algebra, which is this algebra of like K by K matrices with entries in your original algebra. Right. And those two algebras will, that new algebra will always be Morita equivalent to the old one. Is so that the only, is that, the, is that the only kind of um, result from Morita equivalence that you're, that you need? Uh, like, is that the only kind of incarnation of that's, it that you need in order to? That's the, that's the main, I mean, there are other kinds of ways that things can be Morita equivalent, but I think that's about all we need for now, right? So if you know your Clifford algebras, you know that that like Cliff uh, P plus one comma Q plus one is yes. two by two matrix and Cliff P Q. So those okay. are Morita equivalent. So is that's two by so two that gets rid of all those in sense if you're just looking for different Morita equivalence classes. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then yeah. Yeah, and then like this guy is like, uh, what is it? Sixteen by sixteen matrices with entries right. in this guy. And then two by so two. that's yeah, yeah. Okay, and another really just uh, quick question uh, or comment actually is just that it it it, it actually doesn't seem comp just looking at the way the monads are described for the threefold the the, the threefold way and the tenfold way. Um, like the uh -huh. indices were added were multiplied for the first one and added for the second. So it did. Yeah. I, I, um, it's just not, it's, 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 it's not completely uh, obvious that. Um... Um, I probably should have, I probably, sh yeah, I, I was just being expedient the first time. I guess the, the for the threefold way, I could have copied it. And I would say it's like a disjoint union of Z mod two and Z mod one. Okay. <laughs> so so the, what I had been calling one and negative one, multiplicatively, I could have called zero and one additively Z mod okay. two. So that would be like the reals and the quaternion, uh, quaternions. And then and then the z thing I was calling zero would be an element of Z mod one. Okay. And what's what's going on there is that of those, is the um, Z mod two is called the Brouwer group of the real numbers and Z mod one or the trivial group is the Brouwer group of the, uh, complex numbers so there, that is there's no division algebras over the complex numbers no except the complex numbers themselves whereas there are two division algebras over the real numbers uh in which <clears throat> sorry i'm not saying this very elegantly in which the uh in which the real numbers <clears throat> are all of the center so so normally when people think about the stuff they split off the real and the complex case, and 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 they get that breakdown of your three element set into Z mod two and Z mod one. And similarly here, you get this breakup from thinking about the real and the and the complex case separately. But the interesting thing is that in this math here, we really want to unify them. We really want to combine them. But that we combine them in such a way that like the complex numbers sort of dominate the real numbers. So like if you add any of these unbolded numbers to any one of these bolded numbers, you get a bolded number. Uh, so they both have that, both both our threefold way and the and the uh, tenfold way have this sort of property that the complex numbers, once they latch onto something, they don't <laughs> let go. <laughs> once you go complex, so you, you don't go back. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, uh, Tevian has a question. So I'm just gonna, uh, uh, let's see, go ahead Tevian. Okay, so first of all, thank you, John. That was wonderful. Um, my, I've got two questions. The first one is the obvious one. What if you drop associativity and let octonians into the mix? Uh, I, so so I, I have at times known what all the not necessarily associative uh, superdivision algebras are. That, that's not quite true. What I've known is what are all the alternative superdivision algebras. Um, and and you what you get, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but the basic idea is that you 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 get the Octonians, of course, but then you can get the you can get them uh, thrown in, in in various ways. Um, so Todd Trimble 
at my request, worked out all the alternative superdivision algebras. And, and so um, you, get a, you get a couple more. So like you can see here how like the quaternions could show up in, in, a, in, a few different, in a few different ways. So you get that type of phenomenon with the octonians. Do you recall how many? <laughs> no, I don't recall how many. I should look this, I should look this stuff up. And I, I wasn't able to think of anything to do with them at the time. So that would be the thing that would make me like <laughs> care about it. There's, the, there should be something fun to do with them. A possibly related question, is there a relationship between superdivision algebras and things like tensor products of division algebras as show up, for instance, in the magic square? Um, yeah, there has to. Well, um, well, again, for the non-associative case, I, I, I don't haven't, don't know. I'm that. happy with the associative case for that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what's, what's going on? So tensor products are definitely part of the story here. So what's going on with these, with the way that these 10 superdivision algebras are, are being formed into a, a monoid has everything to do with tensor products. So what happens is that like, if I, how do I add one and two and get three? Well, the way I do it is I think of these as superdivision algebras, C and H. I tensor them. Well, I may not get a superdivision algebra always, but I get something that's Morita equivalent to a superdivision algebra. And then I look to see where that one is. And well, it'll be this one here. So yeah, so it has a lot to do with tensoring. But I'll point out that, by the way, that tensoring them as super algebras is different than tensoring them as ordinary algebras because you stick in extra minus signs in in the in the rules for multiplication when you tensor super algebras i think that's where i was trying to go and you've pointed me i now know where i need to look to sort it out thank you okay great uh torsten has a ah, question. yes Yes, um, the questions about um, uh, how all what you presented is uh, maybe uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, is it connected with uh, case theory? So the the, the two periodicity is complex case theory, and the other is the real case theory, the eight classes. Okay, um, my question is then: uh, Okay, if we have these uh, eight classes coming from uh, from the real case theory, I was really amazing because the underlying structure seems to be quaternionic. Uh, but but from the case theory, I know it's the, that is connected with real um, vector bundles. Uh, is there any thing to understand it? Uh, why um, I got these uh, quaternion structures, uh, but the underlying structures in some sense a real vector bundle or something like that? Um, yeah. So if you Let's see, it'll, it'll take me a while to gear up a response, oh, <laughs> but so, no, it's fine, it's fine. But while, while I'm doing it, I'll just tell you that like, if you, if you like it, read the works of the masters on K-theory, like their books by Atia and separately yes. by Bach yeah. on K-theory, they, they actually, I believe, uh, do discuss this. So part of the idea is something like this, that quaternionic vector bundles do show up in, the, in real K-theory. Uh, and so if you look at, so K, real K-theory has this period eight phenomenon, for example. Yes, yeah. But, but the, but, but the, but, but if you, sorry, if, let's see, what do you add the dimension? So if you like, so it turns out that like, okay, what's, what am I saying? Quaternionic vector bundles are showing up here if, yeah. in some in some sense okay and so for example for one thing for example if i have two quaternionic vector bundles and i tensor them you, the, that does not become a quaternionic vector bundle again ah, okay okay but, but what it becomes is a real vector bundle and so that's related right. to the fact that four plus four equals zero and so they 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 do deal with this in much more uh careful way and they basically think about uh, vector bundles with representations of all the different Clifford algebras on them. And so that's one way to think about uh, real K 
the periodicity of real K theory. Ah, so okay, okay. Bundles, but think about all these Clifford algebra bundles. I'm ah, not ah, ah, okay. thinking at all as clearly as I would like, because I haven't been thinking about it so much lately, but but that is definitely going on in this. So, ah, okay. So, so something like that, the SU2 is a real form of SL2C and such things is behind that approach. Okay. Um, second question is about, um, uh, you spoke about these uh, uh, condensed matter phases. Uh, as far as I know, I'm not really an expert, but what they used is uh, they uh, assume a weakly interacting system. And because of that, uh, you have Morita equivalence. Did you maybe know a little bit more about the case when the interaction is maybe not weakly? So maybe maybe one lost the Morita equivalence and then one don't have a tenfold way, or isn't it? Or did you know something about the other cases? Um, I don't I don't know enough. Okay, something about so. that. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. I will say that that the the interesting thing is that this. Um, is that this classification in terms of uh, symmetries yeah. that a system may or may not have? I mean, that classification doesn't really care much at all about the details of your Hamiltonian. You can just take any Hamiltonian and you can inquire do okay. you have yes. symmetry? So that, so I'm just sort of making up this answer, but it suggests to me that there should be some more robust or more general classification of systems without assuming that they are, yeah. Free, free fermion systems are close to it. But they've most of the work is detailed work has been try to find uh, free fermion systems that have these various types of symmetries. So okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sure. the nice talk. Thanks. Um Cole, do you want to call yeah. on people or yes, I? yeah, I've got it. Uh, so zero, uh, please go ahead. Uh, you're muted. I think. I think he should be unmuted. Uh, You're not muted, Zara, but I can't hear you, unfortunately. Can so, you hear me? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you for a very nice talk. I have two questions. In relativity, space and time are intervened, but only time uh, uh, diversion invariance is used in tenfold weight. Why parity is excluded? Um, I should say that this, this although I call this thing T, I'm, I'm really not thinking of it as time reversal. So, so it, time reversal could be an example of, so the, well, so in, in the, so if I was a condensed matter physicist, then I think your question would be an excellent question. So condensed matter physicists should, should indeed study a more complicated classification where they think about C, P, and T symmetry for their, for their systems. So I mean, um, and so you would get a more complicated classification, I believe. Um, so I, I agree with you. I would agree with you in, in that sense. Um, that their tenfold way should just be the beginning of a more complex classification. Um, but here, I want to—I sh meant to emphasize it, but I didn't quite emphasize it. Although we st I started out thinking of T and C as time reversal and charge conjugation symmetry, this result here is a purely mathematical result that does not have anything to do with time reversal symmetry or charge conjugation symmetry. I'm just calling these even unitary operators T and these odd ones C, because that's what the way they show up in condensed matter physics. Uh, I see. So, I see. yeah, okay. so, so, so like if you had some other opinion about yeah. what do you wanted to do with these operators, then you could call them something else. Okay, and uh, the second question is the following. Is there any connection between superdivision algebras and kelly Klein geometries? Sorry, what geometries? Kelly Klein geometries. You know, in in Klein, there is, for example, nine Kelly Klein geometries. Kelly Klein geometry. Kelly Klein. <laughs> Kelly Klein. Kelly Klein geometries. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know about that. What I know about are the 
that there are these 10, there's, there are 10 families of compact symmetric spaces, which are connected with these 10 things. Uh, but it sounds like you're talking about something slightly different. I don't know this classification of nine things okay. that you're alluding to. So sorry, I can't help you. I'll have to find out about okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you again, thank you. Sure. Security, go ahead. Um, hello. Hi. Oh, thank you for this talk. Yeah, so um, I had this question in one of your earlier slides. You said that there's a possibility that the system might have um, either C symmetry or CT or T, like right. um, there were various possibilities. So yeah. there was one of them, which was CPT, but that can't be an option because I mean, a CPT symmetry is supposed to be there in every physical system, right? I um, mean, if you're using, if you're studying relativistic quantum field theory, you can, you can, you can derive CPT symmetry from other axioms. So there's a CPT theorem there, but that theorem, I just want to emphasize. So, I mean, you're right in that sense that it has to be there for those theories. Uh, but I'll just emphasize that that's true for, for relativistic physics. And you actually use the action of the Lorentz group on, on to prove that CPT theorem. So I'm not aware of any theorem in that applies to like in condensed matter physics where you don't have Lorentz symmetries. I, I don't see why you would need to have CPT symmetry there. I might be wrong, but 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 I I, th I think you you have much more flexibility in what your uh, symmetries can be in these condensed matter systems because they don't even have Galilean symmetry, much less uh, uh, Lorentz symmetry. Okay, I see, thanks. And one more quest question, a quick one. So about charge conjugation, generally when we uh, talk about it, we say that you know a, a particle goes to antiparticle, but in the context of uh, condensed matter, you said that we say that uh, a particle goes to, a hole. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry. I was just hearing my own sound. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, but a hole. Uh, what if the particle is charged and a hole is not charged? So how can um, a hole be considered to be a charge conjugate of uh, a charged particle? I mean, most most typically. I mean, I guess I could try to imagine an uncharged hole, but typically I should just emphasize that uh, holes are charged. That is, if you have a if you have a a crystal and you knock an electron out of of one atom, that you get a hole, and that acts as if that acts like a positively charged thing. And and so I mean, so. So you you you, you typically describe uh, holes as as positively charged particles in condensed matter physics, and you can have all sorts of wonderful uh, things like you have these things called excitons, which consist of a an electron and a hole orbiting each other, attracted by attracted by their electromagnetic field, and so on. Now maybe I could make up some other kind of hole that wasn't electrically charged if I was smart enough. Um, Condensed matter physicists are very good at doing all sorts of sneaky things, uh, but I, I don't know about that. But anyway, that kind of if you if you were able to do that, that would probably be an example of a system where you uh, didn't have a symmetry interchanging particles and holes. I imagine because they would be too different from each other. I yeah. just guess. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, Francis, please go ahead. Okay, Francis. thank you very much, bro. Um, please, I wanted to get a little clarity in the in the direct sum you, of the Hilbert uh, of the of your spaces. You made mention of H naught and H one, where the H naught are the boson. You specify them to be the boson, and the H one to be the fermions. Well, I well, I want to emphasize that's one thing you can do, and I said that that's not what I'm going to talk about. But, but yeah, so in supersymmetry, you that is how you that is how you 
let H0 and H1 be. But I'm saying that you can use these H0 and H1 for all sorts of other things too. And I'm saying that in most, that I prefer, in condensed matter physics, they do something else. They let H0 be a Hilbert space for particles and H1 be a Hilbert space for, for holes. Okay. I, so I wanted to add. You have a, the mathematics I'll just emphasize is that you just have a, uh, sorry, uh, is you just have a Hilbert space that's the direct sum of two parts. Then it's up yes. to you, the physicist, to decide what you want to do with that. Have you okay. seen any examples where people have interpreted, have been interpreting this as bosons and fermions? Or is it um, in, 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 in supersymmetry, people d often describe Hilbert's, often sure. do that. Sure, but I mean, in the context of, of 10, of the 10 probably. Strangely, no. Strangely, I have not seen uh, people on supersymmetry working with a tenfold way. That could be easily be just my own ignorance. Maybe I should like do some kind of clever text search to find the find that. Uh, but but you had a did you have more of a question, Francis? Or yes, Prof. I I wanted to get a little clarity. We um you, uh, with the tenfold ways you spoke about the real, the complex, the quaternions, and it has a division algebra. And you mentioned the Clifford, the type of Clifford algebras associated with these things. Um, when, when I see particles, I, elementary particles, I normally um, think of them of some sort of um, Lie algebras with the Lie algebra structure. So I think of root systems. And when I look at root systems, I have we, we have what we call the affine spaces or affine root. What would that come? Where would that come? When, you have an affine, it's an affine uh, root. Uh huh. Um, there are different ways you could, different ways to answer that, I guess. So, yeah. So in this, so in this talk, I was talking about uh, group representations. Yes. There would be a whole similar story about Lie algebra representations. So one kind of thing you would do is like root systems or affine root systems is you could build a, a Lie algebra out of it, which would be like a, like a Katz Moody algebra uh, if you'd had an affine root system. And you could talk about you could talk about representations of of those on super Hilbert spaces. And you could demand a rule like this. But not with group element, but with a Lie algebra element in here. So if you do, a, and I imagine that you could like take an ordinary uh, Lie algebra and think of it as a Z mod two graded. I know you can think of it. Some ordinary Lie algebras, you can think of them as Z mod two graded in various ways, where you put a you take the root lattice. And you put a Z mod two grading on it. So you just pick a way of saying for each point in the root lattice, whether it's even or odd. And it just has to have the property that that when you add the correct property, that like when you add two even ones, you get another even one and so on. And then you could talk about Z mod two graded representations of of those yeah. of those Lie algebras. So that's one thing you could do. And that that's that's I haven't really seen people talk about that much at all in terms of the tenfold way, but you could. There's and, another, and thing, which is there's also like a whole theory of super Lie algebras, Lie super algebras. It's all that can also be studied studied using uh, root systems. Okay, and Prof, with with your gradient, with your Z uh, Z two gradient mod two addition with mod two. Um, when you are adding in mod two, and especially with the Z two gradient, I, I wanted to know what happens. Is is your Z? What if you consider your Z to be um, a prime or an odd prime? What happens to such gradient? Uh, I don't. I don't know quite what you mean, but I don't. I could take Z mod p for an odd prime, but then I can't. I can't. Z mod to grade that. There's no consistent way to to talk about even versus odd if we're working modulo and odd prime. So I, I don't 
can't think of anything that works. Okay, so John, uh, John Barrett, you've got a question. I'm just gonna, un oh, I need to ask to unmute you, so. Yeah, you're muted. Hi, Hi. Hey. hello, John, nice to see you. Yeah. Wanted to encourage you to come and give a part two and talk about these compact symmetric spaces and the tenfold way of those. That would, that would be nice. Great. Well, that would be a lot of fun. That, that, that's a very fun story. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. That's a nice question. <laughs> <laughs> that made it. Yeah. That... We're not asking you to tell it to you right now, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that, that might actually be a, a good way to end things off unless uh, if there's anybody else out there who uh, is brave enough to ask a question. <laughs> oh. That's a way to scare them. <laughs> <laughs> who okay. among you is brave enough? Okay, Michael. Michael, Michael is brave enough. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for, for giving me the chance. I just don't know. Oh, yes, here is. Uh, here, I, I, I show, uh, show my video too, as, as I'm honored to ask a question. I saw your uh, on paper about uh, homotopy hypothesis, and I thought if there is a way to relate this uh, category theoretic construction to what you are doing here, and perhaps even relating it to what Cory did in her video lectures where she tried to include the Octonian perspective. Is there a way to, to find a way to, to, to link them all together from such, uh, such a, a Grotendickian perspective? <laughs> uh, well, I, would, I certainly, that's a very big question. So I, I, I'm certainly hoping to <clears throat> do ambitious things like that. Um, I'm just not, not there yet. Um, the, the, the connection that was mentioned between this tenfold way and K theory uh, connects it to homotopy theory in some interesting ways. So, so I, I, th I think I can get some very nice uh, connections between this and, and homotopy theory. Um, as for the as for the octonians and the non-associative superdivision algebras, I really I really don't know what how they fit into this story at all. So so Tevian already asked me about the non-associative superdivision algebras, and uh, my friend Todd Trimble figured out kind of classification of the nicest ones of those, but I just haven't figured out anything good to do with them. So. So I would urge uh, people who love the Octonians to try to figure out something good to do with the non-associative superdivision algorithms. I, so I like the way Coy related this to compositions of maps in her videos uh, on, on this course page. And, I, and so I thought maybe this would be like a way to make them in a way associative and maybe have this procedure related to chain complexes. So maybe if, if you didn't look at the videos, I think uh, they, they are really very, very nice. They are listed mm -hmm. on the page which uh, accompanies these uh, sessions. And I enjoyed them very much. Unfortunately, it's the first time I, I realized there is this uh, series. And thank you very much for your paper on the on homotopy hypothesis, which uh, is kind of so, in the, so intuitively related to this process of composing maps. That's how I came to, to, to ask this question, possibly relating your positions. Thank uh -huh. you. I, I very much enjoyed your presentation and the videos. And, and so uh, thank you very much for this great opportunity to learn. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. A couple more questions. Yeah, a couple more questions, yeah. yeah. Francis. Francis. Hello. Yes, hello, Prof. Um, 
Liz, I wanted to ask this last question that would uh, that stem food also work for the case of isospins? And when you talk of uh, when the Higgs boson, will it work for that case? Will what work for that case? The, the tenfold algebraic um, structure work for isospins. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this, this math of the tenfold way is extremely general. So it works whenever you have any group acting on a, on a Z mod on a super Hilbert space. So you can always, so you take, so pretty much any physical theory that you can think of will have some group acting on some Hilbert space. Uh, and if it's just a Hilbert space, then you get the threefold way showing up. But if you're able to break your Hilbert space into two parts and have the group either preserve or, or switch those two parts, then, then the tenfold way springs into action. And so that's very general. So I'll leave it up to you to apply it to the standard model. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, we've got a question from uh, Prof Dobre. One sec here. I need to ask to unmute you. There we go. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I missed the beginning of the talk. Maybe you mentioned also uh, this term for the way uh, by the um, the way these are described by the 10 uh, real simple uh, the algebras or groups. Now the point, the question is, what about if we enlarge the, the family to super algebras? They appear in your, in your exposition in another way, but yeah. in view of this. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So, alluding to some other tenfold algebra specification that I've seen of of real simple Lie algebras. What, what is the answer to the super case? I have no I idea. Have no idea. Is the, <laughs> the answer is that I don't know. Sorry, I was just telling people that you, he's alluding to like another kind of tenfold way. Uh, I don't even understand how that exactly how that tenfold way is connected to these tenfold ways that I've been talking about. But so I so I'm not ready at all to think about how it would mm. generalize to these super algebras. But it sounds like a worthwhile thing mm. to think about. If somebody wanted to look up this this other tenfold way, uh, is there what what would you type into Google? Uh, so is there a name for it? Um, I've seen one paper about it and you know who it's by i forget who it's by for all i know it's by you um i yes yeah, so i could i could dig around uh nicole but i, I can't is in the table i'm talking about is in one of your papers my papers yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe it's just quoted there, but it is. I actually uh, uh, saw it first time in your in this paper of yours. I don't even know which paper you mean. I must be getting <laughs> old and senile if I'm writing papers. I don't even know what they are. Uh, so anyway, I'll I'll attempt to find out. <laughs> but I was looking at a paper. It was definitely by somebody else called <laughs> that uh, listed this other tenfold way and was trying to relate it to. The, I can put the, 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 the link and put it in the link here. But yeah, okay, sure. To do it actually. Yeah, I yeah. think the probably... I think the, the chat might be uh, might be off on on this uh, version of Zoom, but um, I, uh, there is no if, chat. Okay, if you could, no if, okay. if if um if you. Uh, if you could uh, I can send you email, you email me, I would really appreciate it. Email. I'm curious to know to know what, uh, what you're talking about. Thank you. I will send it by email. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank, yeah. yeah. Thank, okay. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyway. Um, okay. So, uh, so one more uh, question here, Christopher. Go, go ahead, Christopher. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and thank you uh, for this great talk. I have a question here about, you've got these three, uh, well, two monoids here, the, the minus one, zero, one monoid for the threefold way and this 10 element monoid for this 10 fold way. If you mm -hmm. go to the alternative algebras and you have a similar diagram to your circle, what, what is that monoid and, and how many elements does it have? It, or is, is it a monoid? Is there this kind of similar graded structure for representations? And what is that? Uh huh. I, I I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if it works. Um, so, like, if I if I if I tried to understand that, I would start by thinking about the non-super case, like where we think about just plain old division algebras, and then I would. And then the what's going on in the threefold way. One way to think about it, really, it's disguised here, is that if I, if I like, tensor the uh, quaternions with the quaternions, I get an algebra that's, uh, I guess it's some um, four by four real matrix algebra, and that's Morita equivalent to the reals. So that that explains me why minus one. That's what matches minus one times minus one is one. Uh, if I if I tensor the octonians with the octonians, I know very little about the representations of that non. I don't even know if I know what a representation of a non-associative algebra is for starters. Okay, and then I don't really know much about what about the Actonians tensor the Actonians. So I, I get stuck uh, trying to do things there. I mean, it might be fruitful, but it would definitely require like some hard thinking to get anywhere in that direction. Okay. So it, it looks like Dobrev may have one more question. And we can we can close. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to keep you here forever, but uh, well I I wouldn't mind, but I'm sure you must get tired at some point. So um, I'm just going to see if that was a question or not. Do you have a uh, question, Dobrev? Sorry, I don't know your first name. Yeah. Um, so I'm pressing ask. He yeah, just left his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure maybe I didn't. No, no, no. Oh, it's not another. No, it's just, it was just your hand up from before. OK, that happens. Okay. No problem. OK. Yeah. All right, so um, in that case, uh, this will be a, a good time to uh, close things off. Um, so it, thanks again, John, for such a, a wonderful talk. Um, that was uh, really, really, really clear. In fact, I had some clarification questions that you ended up um, kind of clarifying when you actually gave the talk. Um, it, and yeah, so thank you for giving such a, a clear talk. Uh, that was also really interesting. Um, you know, we'd of course be very happy to have you uh, here again anytime. Um, and yeah, thank you to everybody for showing, for showing up, uh, for your enthusiasm and your questions. Um, so in the ne our next talk is scheduled in three weeks on the 27th of February, 4 p.m. Berlin time. Um, that's So that's earlier than usual. We have Professor Balachandran from uh, Syracuse University speaking to us about a paper he wrote entitled uh, The Gauss Law, A Tale. Um, so thanks again, John, for giving such an uh, exceptionally interesting talk. Um, thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, you know, we'll see you next time. Yes. Thanks, everybody.